First Timothy, chapter 1, verses 12 through 20. Paul's personal witness. In verses 1 through 11 of the opening chapter, Paul sets out to accomplish two important things to help Timothy deal with the issues he faced at Ephesus. He establishes Timothy as a legitimate teacher who was teaching sound doctrine and also condemns the doctrines of the Gnostic philosophers who they strayed from the original teachings of Jesus and the Apostles. In this way, the Apostle Paul drew a line in the sand about who was approved as a teacher and which teachings were acceptable. Once done, Paul changes directions and offers a short prayer of thanksgiving before going on to address other matters. And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who has enabled me because he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Paul's ministry came from Christ, who originally called and sustained the apostles through his many trials. The false teachers were claiming some kind of authority based on their knowledge of secret information. Paul contrasted this by explaining the nature of his relationship and knowledge of Christ who authorized and supported him in ministry. Paul provides Timothy and the readers with this information in the context of a prayer. Although I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an insolent man, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. Paul's main point is that he did not deserve to be an apostle because of who he was before God called him into ministry. He confessed he was a blasphemer a persecutor, and a violent aggressor. This is who he was when he met Christ, and why, he says, he was unworthy to be a leader in the church. Despite all of this, however, God had mercy on him because he did these things in ignorance of Christ. Even though he was ignorant and trying to please God in his own way, he was still sinning. What is unsaid here is that he didn't need secret or special knowledge to gain these things. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. Christ came into the world to save sinners. This was one of the many sayings that were circulating in the church during the first century. Paul quotes the saying and confirms it as true when he compares it with his own life. In other words, his life is a prime example of this saying. However, for this reason I obtain mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show all long-suffering as a pattern to those who are going to believe on him for everlasting life. Not only is this saying true, and true about him in particular, Paul says that he shall be the poster boy, the example for this saying, so others like him could have confidence in God. Paul's message is that if God can forgive him, the chief sinner who tried to destroy both the work and the people of God, then he can forgive you and me, anybody. Now, to the King Eternal, Immortal, Invisible, to God who alone is wise, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Verse 17 is a doxology, a spontaneous praise. Here, Paul is so overwhelmed with thanksgiving that he breaks into spontaneous praise to God. He says very specific things that we believe God to be. God is eternal. God is immortal. God is invisible. Such an amazing Father deserves honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. This charge I commit to you, son Timothy, 
according to the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you may wage the good warfare. In the last part of this chapter, verses 18, 19, and 20, Paul renews his charge to Timothy. The charge or mission originally given to Timothy was based on what the Holy Spirit said about him through the prophets in the church of Ephesus. Paul reminds Timothy that since he was chosen in this way, he should have confidence to enter into the battle against the false teachers. If God chose him for ministry, God will also be with him in ministry. Having faith and a good conscience, which some, having rejected, concerning the faith, have suffered shipwreck. Paul now explained the strategy needed in order to fight the good fight in the name of the Lord. First, keep the faith. Maintain or preserve the faith, meaning the teachings of Christ. Keep preaching and arguing for Christ-centered doctrines. Keep believing this and encourage others to do so as well. And second, keep a good conscience. Faith and moral standards go together. You can't remain faithful or be effective in helping others to remain faithful if your own moral life isn't good. Many times, false doctrine or falling away from Christ is preceded by a moral decline. Of whom are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I deliver to Satan that they may learn not to blaspheme. Paul gives an example of those in the church who had rejected these principles and ruined their faith as a consequence. He mentions two men, Hymenaeus and his brother Alexander. Paul declares that they were delivered to Satan, which is a figurative way of saying that they were disciplined. In the case of these two brothers who blasphemed, meaning they spoke with disrespect concerning God or sacred things, their core sin was that they promoted false doctrine over the gospel. Being turned over to Satan or being disciplined likely meant that they were withdrawn from or disfellowship. These are two terms used to describe church discipline. To be disfellowship means that you cannot enjoy fellowship with other Christians. For example, you are denied the blessings of hearing God's word at the public assembly. You are denied of sharing communion or participating in other occasions, worship or social interaction with other believers. Remember, Jesus said that you are either with him or with Satan. If, therefore, you are separated from Christians, you are also separated from Christ and thus associated with Satan. There is no third choice. Paul's personal witness. And so Paul continues his encouragement of Timothy. He encouraged him to fight the battle with confidence because he has been called and equipped by God for this struggle. It was important for Timothy to keep this in mind since the ones who had the secret knowledge, the Gnostic teachers, also assumed that they had a superior intellect. Paul demonstrates that sometimes punishment is necessary for the good of the brethren and provides examples to show how this shall be carried out. Please join us again in our next video where we will discuss the second chapter of the first letter of the Apostle Paul to Timothy. For now, thank you for your time. May God richly bless you.